And as you're being seated, please open in your Bible to the book of Judges in chapter 9 as we continue through our series through Judges titled Kingdom Come. And this morning as we open God's word, we will see what happens when a nation turns their backs on God. How does God respond to this? And what will happen to the people? Will we see that all play out for God's, in God's word for us this morning? The title of this morning's sermon is Kingdom Collapsing. And this morning we're going to cover a much larger chunk than um, I would typically cover. You know, when we were going through the book of Ephesians, there was weeks where we didn't even get all the way through a single verse. Well, this morning we're covering 50 verses, which is certainly a larger section than we normally would. But I wanted to grasp in total really the collapse and the demise that happens under this King Abimelech and catch the whole scope of that narrative in one morning. So that being said, I'm going to read the entirety of the text on the front end, but know that as we work through it, I'll work through it systematically and reference the things going on, but we, often we'll reread sections multiple times. We won't do that for the entirety of this section this morning. So with that being said, please look with me in your Bibles at God's Word. We'll begin reading in chapter 9 of Judges verse 7, going through the end of the chapter. This is God's Word for us says, when it was told to Jotham, he went and stood on top Mount Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my abundance by which gods and men are honored? And go hold sway over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold sway over the trees? And the trees said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my wine that cheers God and men? And go hold sway over the trees. Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you acted in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam and his house and have done to him as his deeds deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian, and you have risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his sons, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the leaders of Shechem, because he is your relative. If you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jeroboam and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech. Let him also rejoice in you. But if not... Let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer and lived there because of Abimelech, his brother. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years and God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. And the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. That the violence done to the 70 sons of Jeroboam might come. And their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them. And on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. And the leaders of Shechem put men in ambush against him on the mountaintops, and they robbed all who passed by along that way, and it was told to Abimelech. And Gael, the son of Eben, moved into Shechem with his relatives, and the leaders of Shechem put confidence in him, 
And they put out into their field and gathered the grapes from the vineyards and trod them and held a festival. And they went into the house of their God and ate and drank and reviled Abimelech. And Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech and who are we of Shechem that we should serve him? Is he not the son of Jerubbaal, and is not Zebel his officer? Serve the men of Hammer, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Would that this people were held under my hand, then I would remove Abimelech. I would say to Abimelech, increase your army and come out. When Zebel, the ruler of the city, heard the words, Of Gael, the son of Ebed, his anger was kindled, and he sent messengers to Abimelech secretly, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his relatives have come to Shechem, and they are stirring up the city against you. Now, therefore, go by night, you and the people who are with you, and set an ambush in the field. Then in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, rise early and rush upon the city. And when he and the people who are with him come out against you, you may do to them as your hand finds to do. So Abimelech and all the men who were with him rose up by night and set an ambush against Shechem in four companies. And Gael, the son of Ebed, went out and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city. And Abimelech and the people who were with him rose from the ambush. And when Gael saw the people, he said to Zebul, look, people are coming down from the mountaintops. And Zebul said to him, you mistake the shadow of the mountains for men. Gael spoke again and said, look, people are coming down from the center of the land and one company is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak. Then Zebul said to him, where is your mouth now? You who said, who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Are not these the people whom you despised? Go out now and fight with them. And Gael went out at the head of the leaders of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. And Abimelech chased him and he fled before him and many fell wounded up to the entrance of the gate. And Abimelech lived at Aruma and the Zebul and Zebul drove out Gael and his relatives so that they could not dwell at Shechem. On the following day, the people went out into the field and Abimelech was told he... And Abimelech was told, he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. And he looked and saw the people coming out of the city. So he arose against them and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city while the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captured the city and killed the people who were in it. And he raised the city and sowed it with salt. When all the leaders of the tower of Shechem heard of it, they entered the strongholds of the house of el Abimelech was told that all the leaders of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bundle of brushwood and took it up and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the men who were with him, what have you seen me do? Hurry and do as I have done. So every one of the people cut down his bundle and following Abimelech put it against the stronghold and they set the stronghold on fire over them. So all the people of the tower of Shechem also died, about 1,000 men and women. Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city And all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in. And they went up to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. 
Then he called out quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed me. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed to his home. Thus God returned the evil of Abimelech when he committed, or he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads, and upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray as we consider this passage this morning, in many ways dark with judgment and despair, in many ways holds up what should be expected when a people rebel against you. Lord, I pray that we would have humble hearts to receive what you'd have to teach us this morning, that we would not merely read this as an account of something that happened long ago, but as the necessary words of life for us as your people. So God, give us ears to hear this morning. Give us humble hearts. Lead us to your cross. Do it all for your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we work through God's word this morning, it's important to remember how the people got here to the despair and the darkness of Judges chapter 9. God had worked to raise up a savior for the people, a man by the name of Gideon, who as the people were rebelling against God, but crying out to him, he gave them a deliverer in Gideon. And Gideon was an imperfect man, but he was a man that pursued God and what God had for him. And in Gideon's life, we saw that he was used mightily by God to rout out the enemies, the Midianites driven out completely. And he did it all based on what God had commanded him. But towards the end of Gideon's life, there were things seeping into the culture they are now bearing full fruit. Firstly, Gideon introduced this ephod worship that turned out to be idolatrous and led to further idolatrous worship with this syncretistic religion between the God of Baal and Yahweh through the baal Bareth worship, which was now invading the culture. As well, the people were fomenting this desire to dethrone God as their king and rather raise up a human king. Now, Gideon turned down this throne, but we saw that his heart was really desirous of that sort of rule over the people. But once he passed away, the hearts of the people were still there and desiring a human king, and they set over themselves this wicked man of Abimelech to be king over them. And he ruled over them in a fierce way. In fact, he was installed to the throne by committing a first act of murdering 70 of the sons of Gideon, whose nickname is Jerubbaal, a very nickname that came from the one who fought the Baal, the one who fought this Baal religion. And you'll see that his name is used throughout this to identify him in that war that he has with the God of Baal. And he was an imperfect man, certainly, in Gideon, but we see that things got so much worse after he passed away. So it's notable for us in the front end to capture with this that Abimelech was likely not the king over the whole region of Israel, but over just a small part of it. That's why it's still right in many ways not to consider him the first true king of Israel, but likely a king over just a region of it. But the picture we see either way in God's word this morning is that God gives people over in their sin. Much like we read in Sunday school from Romans chapter 1 this morning, that God gives a rebellious people over in their sin. You want depravity? I will give you depravity. You want a kingly ruler to rule over you? I will give you a harsh ruler to rule over you. God gives the people what they want. And we see that in this chapter, I think in four um, really um, big ways that we'll focus on. The, 
this morning. The first is a censure that's given, a prophetic censure. Second is collapse, the kingdom starts falling apart. The third is curses that are issued on various parties involved. And lastly, a conclusion that's given for us in the final two verses of this chapter. Let's begin by considering this prophetic censure that's given from verse 7 all the way through verse 21. It's a prophetic rebuke that's issued to a hard-hearted people. And censure simply means a formal statement expressing disapproval. It worked well because all my points start with C. But really what we see that this is just a prophetic rebuke of the people and warning of what is about to fall upon them. It's not so much a call that, hey, if you get this right, things will go well for you. This is a prophetic statement saying, you did wrong, now expect this to happen. It's a warning about what is about to ensue on the people, and it's given by Gideon's own son. In fact, the only son of his that is worthwhile that is remaining. The only God-following son of Gideon who has not been killed by the half-brother Abimelech. And thus, he gives this prophecy from a mountaintop, and the first half of his prophecy involves this incredible illustration that he uses of four distinct types of trees. And the people are coming to the trees and saying, will you be king over us? I wonder what this illustration could be alluding to. Who are these trees who want to install another tree to be ruler over them? Well, obviously, this is a prophetic message to these people who have been calling for a human king now for multiple generations. And there's three uh, fruitful trees that he begins with. He begins with the olive tree in verses 8 and 9. And of the olive tree, the tree responds to being called to be king by the people. It says, shall I leave my abundance to hold sway over trees? I think there's a particularly unique language there that's been used of holding sway over other trees, right? It's not just to rule them but it's to lord over them, right? And he says, I'm not going to do that, the first one. I have abundant work that I'm already doing. Now, there's symbolism in this olive tree. The oil from the olive tree would have been used to anoint men to their priestly offices. As well, this oil was poured out over the offerings. It was a symbol of abundant blessing and of service to both God and to men. The olive tree knows its lane, ascribed by God, and it's going to stay in it. What about the fig tree in verses 10 and 11? The same sort of thing. Shall I leave my sweet, good fruit to hold sway over trees? Did God design the fig tree in order to rule? No, God designed the fig tree in order to be fruitful, to be a blessing to others, to provide a sweet fruit for the joy of those who would consume it. No, the fig tree stays in its lane. What about the vine? Well, the vine in the same way responds, shall I leave what God has called me to do? I've made by God in order to produce wine that cheers God and men. Certainly, I shouldn't leave that in order to hold sway over other trees. And certainly, we know the various symbols of the vine throughout the scripture. And here it says it produces wine, which is consumed for pleasure and for offering to the Lord. As well, there's incredible symbolic significance as we will enjoy the fruit of the vine at the Lord's table at the conclusion of this sermon. But that's not the only symbolism going on with these first three trees. Trees and vines are symbolic throughout the scripture as being the people of God themselves. Think of the words of Jesus where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches, right? As well in Romans, it speaks of Gentiles who are being grafted into the olive tree of God, right? These symbols of vines and trees are used throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament, to speak of the fruitful people of God doing what he's called them to do. And these fruitful trees respond rightly to the test as the people try to install them as king over them. But these trees are not only a sign of God's fruitfulness, but it's also a sign of his promise to his people. 
Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8 in verses 7 through 10. I'm just going to read portions of this. But it's a description of what the people should expect under the reign of God in the promised land. It says, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of, in part, it says, of vines and fig trees. It goes on to say, of olive trees. And then that section ends by saying, And you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. All these trees are a sign of God's promise and prosperity under his lordship in the land that he has given them. But then there is a fourth tree that comes up in this prophetic illustration, and that is that of the bramble in verses 14 and 15. Now, the first three trees in many ways symbolize life in Eden, right? Abundant, fruitful blessing under the reign of God, doing what God had assigned them to do. Well, if the first three trees symbolize Eden, the fourth tree is symbolic of the fall. For what are brambles known for? Are they known for their abundant fruit to be enjoyed by mankind? No, they're known for their thorns and their thistles. This is clearly symbolic of the fall, of depravity, certainly not a fruitful blessing. And this fallen tree not this tree that's right with God, is the one that accepts the sway over men, calls them to live under his shade. But yet notice how the bramble, even as he receives this high office of kingship over the other trees, does he promise, and it's all going to go well for you. No, even as he comes into the office, he quickly is giving a warning that if you cross him, he will destroy you. And not only destroy you, but destroy the glory of the surrounding forest as well. In other words, he will be a cruel tyrant who will oppress the people, bring devastation to the land. All of this is a picture of Israel in rebellion. They are the ones who are calling out for a king. They could be fruitful trees, but instead they are those bearing the fruit of thorns and thistles, and they're going to feel the punishment because of it. And then goes on, in case anyone didn't catch on to the illustration that he just laid out for them, and makes it very clear in verses 16 through 21 what all he was speaking of. Verses 16 through 19, he lays out for the people, if you had acted in good faith, it would have gone well for you. If you had done what you were supposed to do, you wouldn't be in this mess. I don't know if you've ever been disciplining your child before, and they say, well, why am I getting in trouble? If you had done well, it would go well for you, right? Think of the words that God spoke to Cain in Genesis chapter 4, right? They're in that same boat in this prophetic warning that's given by the surviving brother. He tells them, if you would have just done right, if you had acted rightly towards God and to his servant and to his family, you would not be in this boat. But then listen to what it says in verse 20. It said, but if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo and let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. They're both going to destroy each other. It's going to bring about God's judgment. And that's exactly what happens. And then we see the prophet fleeing in verse 21. For certainly, I don't think he was going to be safe just hanging around after giving a sermon like that. That wasn't a popular one amongst the people, as you can probably imagine. So what do we take from this prophetic warning that's given at the beginning of this section? We must embrace deep down in our bones that we are the ones who choose judgment and discipline from the Lord. God is not one that just delights in disciplining and judging his creation. He doesn't get his kicks out of it. He doesn't get his jollies out of it. Just as no loving parent delights in giving discipline to their kids. They don't enjoy it. It shouldn't be fun for them, right? They do it because they love them, 
but they don't get their kicks out of it. At least they certainly shouldn't, right? That would be a terribly wicked father who enjoyed disciplining his son. Well, God does discipline his children, and he does issue out judgments, but he does it when the people ask for it. Now, they don't ask for it in those terms. They don't say, God, please send judgments upon us. But when they rebel against him, when they chase after other gods, when they forsake his commandments and his anointed, he does answer them in that rebellion. We must realize, saints, that God does not delight in judging us, but we do choose it. Notice the language again of Romans 1, if you go back to there. He gives us over to the things we ask for, and it brings about our destruction. These people chose what's about to happen to them. We can be the fruitful trees doing what God has assigned us to do, running in the fruitful lanes that God has prescribed for us. Or we can align ourselves with the bramble and take the destruction that comes from that. The choice is up to us. This is the warning. And then what happens? We see a quick collapse in verses 22 through 29. In this, we see the kingdom begin to quickly fall apart. And this should be no surprise to us because homes that are not built on a good foundation will crumble, won't they? You don't have to be a master builder to understand that, right? You build your house on the sand, it's not going to last. Well, that's true for homes and construction. It's also true for kingdoms. Kingdoms that are not built on the solid rock will certainly not last very long. And we see this in verse 22 very clearly. What does it say? Abimelech ruled over Israel for three years. Now, this is a shorter reign than a single term in presidency here in the United States. For an office that was often one that would be maintained for whole long lifetimes, ones that didn't typically have terms in their culture. And how long did he stay enthroned and in power over this particular region? Three little years. Sometimes we can read those texts as just time markers. That's teaching us something by telling us three years. It's saying this did not last long. This did not work out well. Compare that to the 40 years that they lived under the leadership of Gideon until he passed away. Now, only three years under the rule of this rebel. And as he reigns for three years, we see that it's not just that he was deposed quickly, but the whole community, the whole kingdom, utterly falls apart and implodes in on each other, and there's strife and division amongst the people. We read in verses 23 through 25 that the men of Shechem plot an ambush against this king. It's, listen to what it says in 23. It says, And God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. And I'll just point out here again, because this is throughout the book of Judges, who was it that initiated this collapse in the kingdom? Who was it that put this division into their hearts? It was God. Everything that we read in this chapter is an act of the sovereign God. He's working through fallen men in order to accomplish his sovereign will. And he leads the men of Shechem to plot an ambush against Abimelech. But at the end of verse 25, we see that Abimelech catches on to the plot. He's made aware of their desire to ambush him and thus narrowly avoids his own life, at least for the moment. But it's not just that men, certain particular men of Shechem plan uh, to destroy him. But we see a particular man in verses 26 through 29 lead a coup against the president. Again, certainly a tumultuous sort of reign. Listen to what it says in verse 26. It says, And Gael, the son of Ebed, moved into Shechem with his relatives and the leaders of Shechem. Shechem put confidence in him. We're already not happy with the human leader we have. Let's pick a new one already because that plan's going so well for us. Can you see the logic of these people and what it's producing? 
And to really drive it home, as we've pointed out throughout the book of Judges, is the particular names that people are given and how significant those are. What does the name Gael mean? It means loathsome. That this is the loathsome leader who is leading the people. And it says son of Ebed, which may have been his father's name, or this may have been a name ascribed by the writer of Judges because Ebed means slave. So this literally is saying in the original language that he is the loathsome son of a slave that is now leading the people to fight against the Abimelech and to be their new ruler for them. And he leads a coup against Abimelech. And it says particularly that this whole encounter happened while the people were eating and drinking and being merry and feasting. Where? In the house of their pagan worship. It says that they were particularly in what became the temple of this Baal Bareth worship, this worship to both Baal and Yahweh that was blended and wicked in God's eyes. It says that they were doing this in that very house. And what is it that Gael said in order to turn these people against Abimelech specifically? He said, he is a son of Jerubbaal in verse 28. Don't you know this king? He's connected to the one who fights for the Baals, or fights against the Baals, excuse me. We can't have him over us. Thus, he inspires the men to rebel against him, not merely for political reasons, but for religious reasons. Do you know what their argument basically is of Abimelech as they're trying to turn people against him? He's too Christian. He's connected with Yahweh too much. We can't have that. He's the son of Jeroboam. We can't have a man like that over us, can we? That was the line of reasoning that this wicked, loathsome son of a slave is using in order to try to get Abimelech out of there. And certainly Abimelech is no picture of godliness or sainthood, but the argument he uses against him is that he's a son of Jeroboam. What should we take from this by point of application? You can try and blend Christianity and the world all you want to, but in the end, the world won't care. They will revile you in your compromised religion just the same as if your religion was true. You can engage in syncretistic worship and blend the gods of this age and the gods of the Bible and try to mix them together in order to make the world happy. But even though you'll lose your own soul in the process, they'll cast you out too because they want nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Syncretism isn't sufficient for the world that hates God. They don't want part of him and part of the world. They want none of him. And thus, they cast out Abimelech in their minds because of this. When you try to make friends with the world and with God, you end up becoming an enemy of both of them. Abimelech serves a great warning to us against this, which then leads to verses 30 through 55, where we see four predominant curses reigned by God against all the parties involved for all this mess that they have created in the kingdom. In the tempest of sin and rebellion, coups and corruption, the Lord answers all the various players who are involved here in their sins. God in heaven sends out four curses. And the first of the curses he issues goes out against Gale, Mr. Loathsome and Insurrectionist himself in verses 30 through 41. We see that Zebel, who apparently was like a mayor under Abimelech or something like that, he was the ruler of the city, still loyal to Abimelech, even though all the men of Shechem at this point had seemingly turned against him. And he informs Abimelech of what Gale is fomenting and instructs the king to prepare an ambush of his own to destroy Gale in verses 30 through 33. You see the kind of peace and tranquility that's existing in this society. The people are trying to ambush the king. The king's trying to ambush the people. Quite unity going on amongst everyone. And thus, as a result of this, and because um, Abimelech was 
caught on to all this, Gael was chased off by Abimelech's men, and Gael's followers were left dead from the whole encounter. It did not go well for this insurrectionist. Gael was put down because of this. Now, he wasn't actually killed, but he was chased off and said that he wasn't able to stay in Shechem any longer. Mr. Loathsome was driven out. But what happened to all the men of Shechem? Well, we read in verse 42 through 45, what happened to them? Let's look down at that section now. Beginning in verse 42, it says, On the following day, the people went out into the field, and Abimelech was And Abimelech was told, and he took his people and divided them into three companies and set an ambush in the fields. And he looked and saw the people coming out of the city. So he rose against them and killed them. Abimelech and the company that was with him rushed forward and stood at the entrance of the gate of the city, while the two companies rushed upon all who were in the field and killed them. And Abimelech fought against the city all that day. He captured the city and killed the people who were in it, and he raised the city and sowed it with salt. This is the judgment that falls on the men of Shechem. When you rebel against the bramble, the great forest will be burned, as the prophet warned them. And this is exactly what happens to the people. Not only are the people laid to waste here and killed who had rebelled against Abimelech, but it says there at the very end of it that he imparts a judgment on them that would last for many, many generations. And what is that? That he sowed it with salt. Thus, not only killing the people who are presently there, but making sure nothing would grow for many, many generations to come. This is a sign of not only an immediate curse, but a curse that would last for generations. Think this is the same sort of imagery of what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, that God not merely wiped out those towns, but he rained down sulfur upon them. Thus making what was initially, you remember Lot was drawn to that land because it's fertile and fruitful, is an abundant land. Well, now it was a land that was salted, no longer producing the blessings of the field that were once there. This is the same picture of judgment here that falls upon the people of Shechem. But what is God going to do about the pagan worship that was engaged in here? God had cursed the rebel leader. God had cursed the rebellious city. But what about the idolatrous worship that had taken over this region of Israel? What does God do about Baal Bareth? Well, we see in verses 46 through 49 that the leaders of this pagan religion go and hide out in their temple of false worship. They see that things are not going well all around them. There's violence and bloodshed everywhere. So these pagan worshipers who had rebelled against Yahweh huddle together in their little temple. And we see that Abimelech sees that this is the perfect time to strike them. They've consolidated themselves and hid themselves out in this temple. And thus Abimelech goes and destroys them. But he does so in a way that should be striking to us in the detail, in the imagery that's used. How does he do it? He cuts off all the branches off the fruitful trees and brings them in and burns those fruitful trees in order to destroy the pagan worship. Again, all of this is hearkening back to that prophetic message that was given on the front end of this destruction. And here we see the providence of God working through a corrupt man. Abimelech was not doing this for religious reasons. It's not as if Abimelech goes, these people fought against the one true and living God. I need to act with righteous religious zeal and take on this religion that's offended my God. Is that the mindset of Abimelech at this moment? No, Abimelech is on a murderous rampage because everyone has come against him and now he's trying to rout out all his enemies wherever they may be from. These were the people who were eating and drinking and plotting his demise with Gale, and thus he wants to get rid of them. So certainly this is not just in the righteous heart of Abimelech that leads to this pagan temple being destroyed. 
But God was working through him, as God often does through ways in which our minds cannot fathom. We see throughout the Old Testament, especially, that God often raises up wicked nations in order to judge his people, and then he judges those nations afterwards. He deals with them in their sin, but he uses them for a reason. And we see Abimelech is being used for that very reason now that God is working through this corrupt man in order to rout out all the false worship that is existing in this area. But does God leave Abimelech alone at the end of the story? Or does he deal with him too? Well, no, the final curse we see rains down on Abimelech himself in verses 50 through 55. Read with me of this account. It says, Then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city. And all the men and the women and all their leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in. And they went up to the roof of the tower. Now you can imagine at this point that Abimelech's pretty confident. He's been pretty successful with people who locked themselves in towers before. He knows what to do. But what happens? Verse 52. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. Again, he's been here before. This plan just worked for him previously. But then what does it say in verse 53? A certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushes his skull. That didn't go well for him. Verse 54. And somehow he survived this encounter after having a millstone crush his skull. It says, then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said, draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed me. And his young man thrust him through and he died. Well, guess what? Many years later, we're still saying a woman killed him. It didn't work. And the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, and everyone departed to his home. Now, certainly, this is God's beautiful providence in bringing this wicked ruler to an end after all the evil he had done. But certainly, we should not miss the symbolism of how our providential God worked all of this out. As we've seen time and time again, the symbolism of the head being crushed, right? And particularly now twice in the book of Judges, we see the enemy of God's head crushed by a woman. What is that all about? Well, certainly that should point us to how the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ruling and reigning, is crushing the head of all of his enemies and is doing so through his bride, the church. And that, but the head crushing through the woman didn't seem to get the job done. There was another instrument that was necessary and what had to be used to finally put him out. What well, it was a sword that pierced him through. And what is the church, the bride of Christ, who is being used by him on high to crush his enemies using in order to defeat that death blow? But it's his sword, his word, the word of our living God. All of this is a glorious picture that points us forward to the greater work that would be done for Christ through his church by his word to destroy all the enemies of God. In conclusion, in verses 56 through 57, what should we make of all the cursing and the death and the deception and the corruption in this chapter? Well, we're told what we should make of it. Listen to what it says, beginning in verse 56. Then God returned the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil of the men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them that came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. In other words, these people got what was coming to them. They got what they were asking for. This is what they wanted and God gave it to them. And it serves as a lesson for us that we might not desire the same things, that our hearts might be turned from these same sort of wicked desires because we see the fruit that is born from it as men depart in these sorts of ways. What are some final points that we ought to take from this chapter? 
The first is that God is in control. In the midst of a crazy chapter of all this drama and all this death and all this deception, the clear thread through it all is that God is orchestrating all of these things in order to accomplish his purposes. Let me ask you, do we live in chaotic times? Do we live in times where the news is crazy and there's division and distrust and violence that happens all around us every day? We certainly do. But just as in Judges 9, can we trust that there's a sovereign God who's ruling and reigning and orchestrating despite the chaos that we can't always discern in the moment? We certainly can. God is in control of all of it. Now, does that mean in the moment we will always be able to perfectly discern how he's using a wicked ruler? What exactly is going on? No, we are not God. We don't always know his ways and the secret things belong to the Lord. But we should have a sure confidence of what his word tells us, that despite the chaos of this world, he is working all things for his glory and for our good if we are in Christ. We can trust that. The Lord uses wicked men at times to accomplish his will, but he is certainly always in control. And the final thing I believe we must take from this is despite trials and judgment, Christ's gospel prevails victoriously. This ends on the note of God taking out all the false worship and the wicked rulers in the land. Let me ask you, do the people deserve God's judgment in this? Do they deserve his deliverance? In fact, this is a striking difference in the book of Judges that we arrive in this chapter. For how had God delivered them from oppressors up until this point? The people were humbled. They were brought low. They cried out to God for salvation. And then he saved them via a deliverer. How are the people saved from their oppressors in this text? God's grace and mercy alone. The people don't do anything to earn God's mercy in delivering them from the hand of the oppressor in this text. Nothing in this text indicates they're deserving of what he gives them. But we serve a merciful God. This should be encouragement to us, for our salvation is certainly not based on our own doing, is a gift of God, not a result of works, lest none of us should boast. We don't deserve God's salvation. We don't deserve his redemption. But we serve a merciful God. May we remember that as we move to the table. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you for the hope of the gospel victory that we find in your word. We thank you that despite judgment, your mercy prevails. We know from your word that Christ did not come into this world ultimately to bring judgment, but to bring mercy. And Lord, we praise you for the good work of Christ Jesus. We praise you that rebellion against you is a temporary endeavor. That despite the pain that comes from judgment and discipline, that the eternal glory of your redemption will last forever. That your judgment's temporary, but your mercy for those who are in your son will last for all time. God, I pray that all of us would know that this morning. And Lord, I pray that we would be faithful to stay in our lanes just as the olive tree and the fig tree and the vine, doing what you prescribed for them to do and not getting higher ambitions than that. Lord, would we be content to do the work that you've called us to do, to not get wrapped up in worldly visions of vain glory, but to be fruitful in the work that you've called us to do and receive the abundant blessing of serving you and other men by doing that. God, would you help us in these things? Would you lead us by your grace and your mercy? Would we never depart from the glory of the cross of Christ? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.